Hello, welcome along to Writer's Routine. This week we're joined by the amazingly prolific bestseller, David Baldacci. Uh, I find David's books are everywhere. You know when you go on holiday, hotel, B&B, log cabin in the woods, something like that, and you always see the well-thumbed books in reception for you to borrow? There will be a David Baldacci in there. Uh, When you're looking through all the books that your parents hoard, uh, there will be Baldacci's there too. Uh, That's because he publishes around two books every single year. He is phenomenally successful. His new novel is an Amos Decker story. It's called Walk the Wire. Uh, We talk about how he knows whether an idea is a goer, how he plans his year to publish two stories in just 12 months. Uh, We talk about the research that he does, how thoroughly he figures out what he will write every day, and what happens when sometimes all that planning goes wrong, and the story isn't what it's meant to be, and it's not working, but you've got to get it done. I got in the proper state of mind. I finally figured out what I wanted this story to be without any outside influences, and I wrote another 140,000 words in two months and delivered the book in June. Um, And that was part, partly out of just fear, (laughs) Um, but also anger at myself for allowing myself to write a story, not being in the proper state of mind. So that one always stands out as, you know, my tale of woe. Loads of amazing tips and advice and inspiration just like that with David Baldacci on the way in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes. Welcome along. It's Writer's Routine. Very simply, uh, if you're new around here, this is the show where we take a look inside an author's working day to figure out how they get stuff done, how they take a story from their head and put it onto the page. Uh, My name is Dan Simpson. Thank you so much for finding us and for giving us a listen. Today, we've got an author on who has done all that, taking a story from their head, putting it onto the page many, many times, over 40 times uh, to be almost exact well over 40 times. David Baldacci has written all sorts too. Um, Mysteries, thrillers, fantasy adventures, crime stories, ones about government corruption, uh, even kids books as well. Storytelling is just in his blood. He's been writing ever since he was a kid and he picked up an old notepad of his mum's Uh, and his stories are across a whole range of characters as well. And in the chat you can hear about how he decides which character is going to be written about next. Now his first novel was Absolute Power published back in 1996, written when he was a lawyer. Uh, So we also talk about how he thinks doing that sort of work affected the way he write. Did it make him more fastidious to the work? Because as a lawyer, you often are uh, working all hours of the day. Did he enjoy the creative freedom? Uh, The story was then turned into a movie with Clint Eastwood as well. Uh, His new novel is called Walk the Wire where FBI consultant Amos Decker, who has a perfect memory, is called to the North Dakotan Badlands. While he's there uh, investigating a murder, he uncovers a religious sect and a strange military base as well. As always, we talk about the very first idea that he had for the story, how, how it came from him reading just a huge number of newspapers and magazines every single day. Uh, and we also learn about the process of how he picks threads and writes subplot lines that he knows will grip a reader. I'm interested, is it all organic or or does he force them through at all? Because he's got to publish two books a year and he's done it many, many, many times. Stay there, you will hear all of that. And we start, as we always do, with what David sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. Right now, I've got, I'm looking at a bunch of my own books on a shelf in front of me and I'm sitting at a desk with huge notebooks and uh, uh, filled with research and notebooks filled with plots and lots of pens. <laughs> Is there anything inspirational in there, in there David, a- apart from obviously an amazing wall of your own books that will help you keep ticking? But uh, have you got uh, posters on the wall, things that are, are plot specific that keep you writing? I have a picture of David Suchet as Hercule Poirot uh, hanging above my desk. I have a photo of uh, Conan Doyle. I have movie posters of some of the movies and television series we've made from some of my books. Um, I have a window that looks out uh, across the way in Northern Virginia to a super secret uh, spy facility um, that, uh, you know, it looks like it's a wall. It's all a building full of windows, but there are actually no windows in the place because they're afraid of people spying on them. It's actually fake windows behind them or concrete walls lined with copper so nobody can sort of electronically spy on them. And, and they tend to watch everything going on around them. So I only open my blinds a little bit. <laughs> 
I, I'm always amazed at writing desks, David. I mean, you've written over 40 books now. I would imagine your writing desk is something to behold. Uh, can you just talk us through it? Two desks that I use. Well, actually three. One is a desk where I have a computer connected to, to the web and I'll go on that to do things. Uh, two, I have a, a round table with a bunch of chairs around it, and that's where I really work. I have my laptop there, but I'm not connected to the Internet, and I will, I will compose, write, do research. But I have an uh, editing desk, and this is a, a desk my, my wife bought me years ago. It's, an, um, it's from the, if you can imagine it, the Ernest Hemingway Furniture Collection. I have no idea. I guess the family sold those rights to make money, you know, long after he had passed. But so it's a, it's one of those editing desks where you, it's got a, um, it's a angle top to it. You can open that top. It has little boards on either side, support boards. You bring them out and rest on top of there. And that's where I do all my big editing. I do editing longhand, the big editing where I print the entire manuscript out. I have my pens and I just go to work on it because I think better in cursive. So I do all of my editing there. Why does it take you three de- de- three desks, David? What's why? I mean, very simp- very simplistically. Why is this not done on just one? And how have you learned over time that you do need uh, separate spaces to do different parts of your work? So, if I'm in a research mode, yes, I'm thinking about the story, but I really have to be more put my journalist hat on, where I'm out interviewing people, compiling the facts and data and information I need to build my stories. So if I'm if I'm on um, searching the web and I'm on my computer and I'm building things in that I need to know about and searches, that's one part of my brain. I'm, I'm totally focused on the storytelling. I'm focused on fact and data collection. And when I sit and I at my other desk and I'm composing, then I'm really building the story that I've taken the information I've gotten and along with all the parts that I fictionalize and come up with my imagination, then I'm putting the whole puzzle in the story together, atmosphere, characters, description, narrative, and all that. Then that's the process of building the story. So once the story is built and it's done, at least in a first draft, then you're sort of compartmentalizing again, and you're moving on to that third stage of, you know, you've built, you've gotten the information, you built a story, and it's almost like building a house. So I like to start off with the framing, the foundation of the framing. You pour the cement footers, you put up the studs, and then you have the basic structure and framework of the story. Then you go in and you put all the things that actually make it look different from the house next door. And that's the walls and the roof and the shingles and the interior and the doors and, you know, everything you have on the floors and the the furniture. Those come in stages. And then once that's all done and the package is complete for the first time, then I like to move over to my editing. It's almost like you're moving compartments in in a house or compartments in a building or compartments in your mind. Then you move over there with this finished product, quasi-finished product, and then you just rip it apart. And uh, having individual spaces to do that works for me. Before I move, I've got so many questions about that that have just led from it. Very quickly, I want to stay in the room. If I were to walk into your, your writing space, would I have any clue as to the story that you're telling in terms of plot points on the wall, maybe mind maps on a whiteboard? Years ago, I tried a whiteboard. It just didn't work for me. I got kind of bored with it. You know, it was too much effort to sit, sit down and write these things out and have these flow charts, and it just felt a little silly to me. For me, my here's how I approach it. I immerse myself so deeply into the story that I'm writing that I have every fact, figure, character, piece of data point that I need in order to build a story in my head, you know, compartmentalize where I need it to be. I keep mo- notebooks and all that where I put write down my many plots and ideas and thoughts. Um, but the flow is in, is in my head. And I think one reason to do it that way is because to write a really good story, you need to be immersed in the moment. You need to be immersed in the story so much so that if anybody asks you a question about it, you can answer it right off the top of your head. And, and if you do it that way and not rely on sort of outside artificial, you know, charts and stuff, uh, which allows you maybe not to immerse yourself so deeply into it. When I say immerse, I mean immerse yourself into the characters. You write better characters if you become sort of who those characters are. If you think as deeply as you want them to think about things in the, in the novel. And one way to do that is to keep it all inside of yourself. You talk about this quite analytically, as if this is the, the result of, of ponderings and introspection. I mean, you've written over 40 books, so there has to have been some along the way. Uh, you, going back to the, the three desks and the way you, com, com, you, the way you compartmentalise, as you said, how long into your storytelling was it before you started to figure out the best way that you write? 
it was years um, because I look, every writer needs to figure out what process works best for them. Some people are outliers. God bless them. Some people are seat of the pants. God bless them. I'm kind of a hybrid where I'll do a few outlines, outline chapters, um, outline major movements, you know, have things in my mind that I know that I want to accomplish in the novel as far as plot movements. It's almost like big movements in a musical score. Uh, and then filling in the lyrics later. But you want to know what the sweeping sounds are going to be. It took a while. Um, and I may change my process down the road. And the great thing about being a writer is once you find a process, there's no rule that says you can never change. You can change it anytime you want. So outliners may become seat of the panthers, and seat of the panthers may become outliners or something, a hybrid in between. Get up in the morning. I, um, I have We have dogs, so I like to take the dogs for a walk and take care of the dogs. Then I typically will go upstairs, you know, wherever we are. We have a few places where we stay during the course of the year and um, and work out. I like to row um, and I like to do the elliptical. I like physical stuff. I've been I was an athlete high school and college and I like to keep it up. And the endorphins are a nice sort of mental flow as well. and kind of gets you going. And then I'll, you know, I'll come down to the office and I will each day I write until the tank is empty. Um, so each day I will come back down and I'll look at the one or two chapters that I've just written the day before to get me back into the flow of the story. And right now I'm writing something very unusual for me. I'm writing two different books at the same time. I almost never do that. Um, the reason I'm able to do it now is because they're two distinctly separate books. So this week I call it my 1949 week. Because this week I'm going to be writing in 1949. It's a sequel to a book I wrote last year called One Good Deed about my gumshoe detective, Alan Wishers Archer. So this whole week will be devoted to him and totally focused on his uh, his story. So I'm working on chapters right now that are pretty important in the flow of the story. He's meeting up with a very important character. And during the course of this, I will be um, writing I will be stopping and then jotting down notes. I will be sitting, thinking. I'll be walking around. Maybe I'll take the dogs for another walk because I know that I've got to think of some things that are going to be important uh, during the course of the novel. Um, I'll write as many pages. I don't count pages. I don't count words. I just write until the tank is empty. But I kind of know what I want to accomplish. But even, you know, I have to tell you, nine times out of ten, when I've accomplished what I thought I wanted to accomplish that day, I will get up and go do something else, do something with my wife, or the kids, if they're around. Uh, but I always come back. And during the course of the day, I will probably come back to my, my office to write a dozen times. Um, not that they was planned out that I was going to do that, but, but the, the story is pulling me back. So this week is 1949. Next week, I'll be in 2020. <laughs> Again, I have my own personal time machine. And I'll be working on the sequel to the Atlee Pine uh, series. Um, the book I wrote last year called A Minute to Midnight. That's a sequel to, to that book. Um, so it's really, it's my days are typical for being atypical. I know I, you know, they're, they're seen as you know, writers routines, but my routine is anything, but every day is different for me. Um, but almost every day involves me sitting down and looking at paper, uh, putting words together, looking at a computer screen. And that's, that's a daily thing that happens for me. It's not a day that that does not happen. You said that you are quite atypical um, and that you don't count words, you don't count pages. How much time, ideally, do you like to dedicate to the story, even if you are getting up and down from the table 12 times throughout the day? How much time do you hope to dedicate on a single day? If you added the hours together, and not every day is exactly the same, it would be anywhere from like six to eight hours a day. We are totally focused on the writing project, whatever you have to be doing. Some days are longer, you know, as I get towards the end of a novel and the energy and it sort of becomes more and more frenetic because I know everything now that I want to tell in the story and my fingers are flying. It could be 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And that, that basically is sleep and write, sleep and write. Um, that almost always happens towards the end of the novel because I'm just in a, I'm, I'm just flush with energy about it. Everything is crystallized in my head. I know every word that I want to say and it just pours out. And I don't even count the hours at that point. I guess my wife, you know, she doesn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> on, on days when you are struggling, David, because they all they all come for authors. Um, but as I keep saying, you've written so prolifically. How many what, what what tricks do you have to make sure the words are coming 
when to all intents and purposes it seems like they just won't happen that day but you know you need to get the pages down what do you what do you do to 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 to, to uh, tease them out one of two things and they almost always work one is i just go do something else i'll go work on another writing project um, and so if I'm stuck in 2020 and I can't move the story forward, I'll pop over to 1949. Um, or I'll go and I like to, um, putter around the, you know, and so I'll go and putter, you know, if we're, if I was at our lake house where we have boats and stuff, I'd go down and work on the boat or do something with a boat or go paddle boarding or go sailing. Um, the other thing that I work through many plot issues, um, is I could take a shower sounds crazy, but I got to tell you, the water pours on your head and all of a sudden you are, everything crystallizes and you are in the moment and your mind is working a million miles an hour and it just bores right through any problem you have. And the, the other added benefit is I'm incredibly clean all the time. You, you smell amazing. <laughs> I do. People were like, wow, you are the best smelling writer I've ever encountered. That should be on the books. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, listen, uh, you, when, when you, you say when you start the day, you begin by looking over the, the chapters that you've done on the previous day. How, how do you know where the story is going next? How do you know what you want to ideally get written on that day? You know, before I uh, quit the day, be- you know, the day before I finish writing for that day, then my mind is already immediately leaping ahead to the next obvious points in the plot. And there could always, there's always choices to be made. You know, I could go to the left or to the right, or I could go straight ahead. Then you have to work through those because if you spend a lot of time building this and you've made bad choices along the way, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to collapse and you're going to have to go back and think of a better way to do it. So I never just off the top of my head, you know, okay, he's going to do this or she's going to say this, or they're going to find this bit of information or this character is going to deliver this vital source and they're going to need to move forward in the story. Okay. Those are all legitimate questions and issues you have to go around, but there are probably five, six, 10 different alternatives and possible answers for each of them. So my job after I finish writing for the day is to think about all of those things while I'm out doing the rest of my day. I'm eating dinner or watching television or reading a book or visiting with family or friends or self-isolating as we all are right now. Um, I have to work through the the best possible answers to each of those questions Um, because I know that once I put it down, then I'm going to be running with that. Um, and if I built it on a faulty foundation or structure, then I'm going to have problems down the road. So for me, it's better to take the time to figure it out now than just hurrying along, sticking something in. The only time I ever do that is at the end of the novel when I've got several competing ideas for how I want it to be ultimately resolved. And sometimes I know that I want to get a draft up to people to look at, my agent, the publisher, and I will I will write an ending. And I will send it up to them and I say, this is a – Pin, P-I-N, ending. I've stuck a pin in it. This is not the ending that's going to happen. Um, I'm thinking of that one now, but I wanted you to take a look at the rest of the novel. Uh, But just keep in mind that the ultimate resolution will be different than the one I've sent up. But I've just done it for purposes of time and management. Um, And then I said, because the endings obviously are critically important. That's what people carry away from the novel. And I want to make sure that I have the absolute best one, depending on what I've built throughout the story. So, again, you need to take the time to answer all those questions about what's the next direction, what's the next step, who delivers the information, what choices do your protagonists make? Because once you have that going, it's like a, it's like a river flowing. And it's really hard to change the course of a river once it's really rolling. Some days it's all about how you feel. Uh, some days are... I'm more structured, story oriented because I want to build this framework out, you know, the studs of the house, knowing that I'm going to come back later and make it better, having better word choices, better language flow, uh, better dialogue. But I just want to get the structure out some ways just to see how it looks standing there naked. Is it is it holding the roof up? You know, is it working the way I want it to work? I can always change the smaller details, but I can't knock the studs out. So you have to make sure the studs are right, and then you can go back in and have different word choices, make the language better, the prose better, more stylistic uh, than when you first started. Those are changes. Those are modifications that can be made. Um, it's very difficult to uh, modify a section by knocking a wall down, because when you knock the wall down, then what happens? The roof comes down, and then you have to start from square one. So some days I feel really good about the prose and and the words that I've written. Uh, in the first draft, those are going to be the same words in the finished draft and in the one that people read. 
Other days, I know that I, as I'm running along, I, I think to myself, this is, uh, this is a structured day. This is where I'm building the basics. And I know that I'm going to come back. I'm going to make these sentences better. These paragraphs read better. I'm going to have different word choices. But right now, I just want to get the structure out. And I'll come back and finesse the rest of it. What's been the hardest house of yours to get built? What, what was the story that really was a, a struggle to get down, to work out, to iron out along the way? Um, it's about 10 years ago, a book I wrote called Last Man Standing. It was a very testosterone-driven story about an FBI hostage rescue team sniper named Wet London. Um, he had been uh, part of a team that had walked into an ambush, and his entire team was killed. He was the only survivor. One, he felt enormous guilt. And two, people were suspicious that maybe he was part of what happened, because why did he get to live, right? So he was horribly um, injured, uh, facially scarred uh, during the ambush. So I wrote the novel. It was incredibly complicated, multiple layers. But um, I wrote it in a mental state that wasn't best, just because I had um, extended family members who were going through some incredibly tough times that I was intimately involved with, just because of you know I was a former lawyer and all that. So when I sent the draft up, it was 150,000 words. It was a long novel, and everybody read it, and they were like, boy, this is not you. This is not you. We don't know what's going on, but this is not working. And, and I had, you know, written the book not in the proper state of mind and that it skewed everything. And so not only was, you know, the interior decorating of the place sucked, <laughs> but the studs were rotten and the roof was leaking. So I remember taking that book back and it was, that was in April. I was supposed to deliver the book in June and I cut 140,000 words in one day sitting in my office. I remember that vividly. I had 10,000 words left. Um, I got in the proper state of mind. I finally figured out what I wanted this story to be without any ins outside influences. And I wrote another 140,000 words in two months and delivered the book in June. Um, and that was part, partly out of just fear, <laughs> um, but also anger at myself for allowing myself to write a story not being in the proper state of mind. So that one always stands out as, you know, my tale of woe. It, it draws us to the idea you're, you're, you're speaking of is you have to get this done by June because it is your job because you've got so many readers around the world that are, are waiting uh, f for one of your novels, which brings us to my next question and the next routine that I want to kind of bug you for if this is all right. Um, when you know you need to deliver, uh, I guess, a book a year, a book every couple of years, uh, how does your year look? Uh, at, so if you take, if you're, it, just say, for instance, January to January, uh, at what point will you get a new idea? When will you start working on it? When is your first draft being handed in? When are you starting to think about the idea for the next book? Can you just take me through 12 months uh, in the life of writing a book? For the last eight, eight or nine years, I've been on a schedule of two books a year. So I deliver, I have a book published in the spring in April and I have a book published in the fall in November. So and if it's January, then um, the fall book obviously has already been published and I'm probably halfway through writing, you know, the spring book. The spring book will be delivered probably, in fact, by January, I'm well into finishing the spring book. So in, in let's say January, February, well, you know, actually, um, can I back you up to December? Because December is ordinarily when I will deliver the completed manuscript for the spring book. It'll be out in April. So while everybody's reading that novel and getting ready to publish it in April, um, as soon as I finish the book for the um, as soon as the book for the fall is published, um, I'm already you know finished the book for the next for the spring, and I'm already starting to think about and write the book that will be coming out in the fall. So for instance, right now, when I talk about my 2020 book, which is the Atlee Pine sequel, that'll be published in November. Um, I probably started writing this book in December of last year. Um, and um, I'm about 85,000 words into it. So in January, I'm already in the middle of writing another book. Um, when I deliver this book, the Atlee Pine book, I probably will deliver this book uh, next month, end of next month in May. Then I will spend the next probably month finishing the 1949 book uh, that will be published in summer of 2021. Um, and at the same time that I'm finishing the summer 2021 book, I will be uh, plotting, outlining, thinking, and writing 
the book for the spring of April of next year. Uh, so everything becomes kind of, it's, it's in my mind, I know where all my marks are. I know the cues and the deadlines I have to meet. I've never missed a deadline in 25 years. I always tend to deliver my books early. Um, so I know that if I have to deliver two books a year, then um, I know when I have to deliver each one and I know when I have to start writing each one. And the, and the answer to when do I start writing each one is like, I'm never not writing. There's no break. There's no summer hiatus. There's no holiday for me. It's, but that's just fine because I love the, the process of writing. And I have lots of time, you know, during the day to go off and do other things and have fun and spend time with people I care about. But it's, um, it, and I know it sounds like sort of a manufacturing process, but it's not because I'm not building a widget I'm, from plans that somebody gave me. There's a lot of spontaneity and epiphany, but hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into this because you're creating something that didn't exist before you thought of it. Uh, there's no game plan for this. You know, I have to come up with new characters every time, a new plot, new ideas, new narration, new dialogue, new everything. Um, so it's like I keep building a brand new house over and over again. And I get to live in it for a few days and I move away. <laughs> Before we get back to it with David, just uh, I want to give you a massive thanks if you've left us a review over on Apple Podcasts. I know you might not be listening that way, uh, so bear with me just like two secs while I talk about this. Uh, you can even skip forward if you like, and then in a little bit you'll get me pushing you to the Patreon page. Uh, it never stops. The requests never stop fit for you to do stuff. Uh, if you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts, though, if you haven't left a review, please do that. It takes such a tiny chunk of time and it really helps us out. And it doesn't just help us out. It helps other people who need the help of our authors find our chats so they can get that help. Um, some lovely ones coming in recently as well, full of praise. I'm absolutely in awe if you've sent one of those. Uh, I would love to see more, though, if I'm honest. Um, if you can, please do leave a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. Find Writer's Routine. It takes like two seconds of your time. Uh, another way that you can help, as always, is by pledging to support us over on Patreon. Just a dollar or so a month really goes a long way. It helps us carry on bringing you these chats as often as we can. Uh, there's a few different tiers that you can support us at as well. Uh, so you get a little bit of merch from us to say thank you. Uh, I am trying really hard over this lockdown to keep up the interviews. I've got a few in the bag. Probably need a little bit more, but I, I want you to carry on getting tips from some of the world's best authors. So if you want to help me do that, uh, please pledge what you can. Uh, just a little bit or so every month really helps us out over at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Right, let's get back to it then with David Baldacci talking about his brand new Amos Decker book, Walk the Wire. Uh, in this half, we talk about how working as a lawyer influenced how he got to work writing. Also, we learn how he chooses which of his characters he'll write about next and what happens when, like a massive Marvel Cinematic Universe, their stories start to cross over. Uh, and we pick things up, talking about when the first idea for Walk the Wire popped into his head. I'm a voracious reader of both books, newspapers, everything. I probably read a dozen you know, periodicals a day just because I crave information and knowledge. I just like to be well-informed. I like to know what's going on. So I have a wide diversity of platforms that I read from and learn things from. I was reading – I read a magazine article about North Dakota. And in, North, in, in the eastern side of North Dakota, there are two really curious things, and they're close proximity to each other. One is a super secret Air Force facility called an Eye in the Sky that was deployed in the 1960s by the Department of Defense. And its sole job is to look out for missiles being fired at us from other countries. Back then, it was Russia because it was the middle of the Cold War. Today, not so worried, much worried about missiles, but they also act as sort of air traffic controllers for things in space, you know, space debris, space stations, you know, shuttles, whatever. So a few years ago, they had a lot of extra land. And I guess because the Department of Defense, just like anybody else, needs extra money, <laughs> they sold some of that land to a, a religious sect called the Hutterites. The Hutterites started off in Germany centuries ago. They live on the common scripture philosophy of communal living, so that if you live in a colony, everybody dresses sort of similarly uh, they're like Amish, except they can drive cars and use machinery. But every nobody owns anything. Everybody owns everything. So it's all communal living. and Everybody shares whatever they create. So they, this Hutterite uh, colony, bought all this extra land. So you have these, you know, this religious sect plowing fields next to this super secret eye in the sky. So that was 
I read that article. I was like, that is really interesting to me to have this super secret facility in this religious colony right next door that bought some of this land. How might I build that into the story? Now, I've been interested in um, lots of different things related to energy. Um, and in this, the thing that's made sort of America energy independent is one thing. It's called fracking. And fracking is a shale oil industry where they go down and deep into the ground and they uh, detonate these uh, deposits of oil and gas by blowing it up and then sending liquid down to force the oil and gas up to the surface. It's um, They finally figured out how to do it for years. They couldn't figure out how to get to the oil and gas. Um, one guy finally figured out that you don't just drill, drill vertically. You drill vertically down for a long way and then you start drilling horizontally. And that's the way you can get to the oil and gas. Big industry. You know, towns that were nothing are now boom towns. It's kind of like the California gold rush of 1849. Everybody's running there. It's so much money that you made. So what I did, I thought, okay, I, I really would like to explore the fracking world. And I think my character, Amos Decker, would be really uniquely uh, sort of designed to do this because he can go to the small town and just talk to people and figure things out because he's from a small town. So I took – but the, the, the fracking industry takes place on the western side of North Dakota. So I picked up the religious colony and – um and I picked up the eye in the sky and I plopped it into the western side of North Dakota in the middle of this fracking town. And then I had all the elements together that I wanted to create Walk the Wire. Um, but it was really just reading that magazine article that spurred my interest in thinking about building a story up there. A rather annoying follow-up question, a bit dead easy. Uh, simplistically, what happens next? So you've got Amos Decker, who's going to investigate this. It's some, th- Something's going to happen, but you need a plot. You need a reason for him to be there. Your stories are murder thriller stories quite a lot of the time. So, so what happens next for you, David? You've got that initial idea. How do you know, how do you figure out what Amos is going to be investigating as he goes up there? I like to use the analogy of, okay, what, what fuel I'm going to put into the tank? And that's going to make the car grow. So how do I get Amos Decker? He works for the FBI. How plausibly can I get him to go up there to investigate something? So I had this idea of a woman who was murdered and her body was found, which, you know, okay, that happens lots of times, unfortunately. But what was different about this? What was different was that she'd already had a postmortem performed on her. So whoever killed her autopsied her. So you're wondering why would anybody do that? You know, was it a ritualistic killing? Was this just going to be a pattern of a serial killer? But again, just because it's a murder doesn't mean the FBI gets called in. So why does the FBI get called in? Well, the FBI gets called in because, as you learn about in the novel, of who the victim was. Her name was Irene Kramer. And Amos Decker is also wondering, why the hell am I in North Dakota? This is just a local murder. Local cops can take care of it. But then he sort of comes at the same resolution. It's not about the crime. It's about the victim. This woman, for whatever reason, must have been really important to the federal government at some point. They want to figure out what happened to her. That's why I'm here. Now, with that in mind, then all of a sudden, and this is also how you can get around, uh, you know, writer's block and figuring out, OK, I've got a story, but I have nothing to do with it. I've got the one plot. I've got a woman who's murdered. OK, that's cool. But where do I go from there? What I like about building stories is that when I off the first act, off the first sort of initiation of the story, I have five or six subplots built into it. So I never have to worry about writer's block because I have six leads all ready to go from that one event. I'll give you an example of another Amos Decker book. It was called um, The Fix. And in The Fix, Amos Decker is walking to the FBI Hoover building where he works. And he's walking down the street. Lots of people are walking. And he sort of focuses on a guy and a woman. The guy is walking the same direction that Decker is. The woman's coming towards them. Something in the man's body language tells him that, you know, there's something off going on. He seems like a businessman. He's got a, he's got a briefcase. He's dressed in a suit. The man and the woman are coming towards each other. Then they both turn in the same direction, and they're walking in the same direction where Decker will be eventually going. And Decker really doesn't think anything bad's going to happen. He's just watching people. And then he just body language between the two. It seems like the woman is very aggressive to man and something. She's going to do something to him. And he's wondering whether he's going to have to step forward and sort of intervene. And before he can, the man, the man, not the woman, the man pulls a gun out of the briefcase, kills the woman, then turns the gun on himself and shoots himself in the head. And so from that one initiation, I have all these subplots and all these questions that I can answer by driving the plot forward. Who was the woman? Who was the man? What did they know each other? 
I thought the woman was going to kill him. He killed her and then he shot himself. And from that, I probably have five or six subplots that I can move forward. And the same thing that happened in Walk the Wire, because you had the woman, she was dead. Who killed her? Her body was autopsy. That's another lead. That's another set of facts that I have to move forward then. Why is the FBI called in? We don't know. That's another subplot. Then you have to explore her past because you come to a resolution and it's not the crime, it's the victim. There's something in her past that makes her important. So from that very get-go, I never had writer's block from there because I am off to the races. So it's how you structure that first initial episode, that first initial chapter uh, that allows you to bleed off in so many different directions. How many? How much of your storytelling is this? This is an interesting question to try and phrase, and so so an, so an author doesn't get annoyed. All right, so just bear with. Um, how, <laughs> okay. how, how much of the, the the story is told from a natural position of the story, and how much is is it told methodically in what you know reads as a good story? So, for instance. When you've got the, the 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 woman in in Walk the Wire who has already been autopsied, how much of that was a natural thought that came into your head, and how much of it was, hang on, that's something that that's never been done before. This woman's been autopsied. That will give me an excuse to get Amos to come up there. Uh, how, and these these threads, the question that you're asking, how much of those, the system of doing that has been learned over twenty five years of writing novels. You know, this is a, writing is a crap. So it's you're an apprentice for life, you're never a master of it. So you're constantly learning and developing and evolving. Um, for me, uh, after having done this long, I won't say that it's instinct, but I certainly know what works for me and some pitfalls to avoid that I've fallen into myself as a writer, and I know how to avoid them from right now. It's almost like stepping over the, the step that squeaks so the killer won't hear you coming, <laughs> you know. Um, so let, let's take the autopsy. So with the, with the autopsy, I had at least a couple of different reasons why that would be important in the story. One, it was certainly would um, ignite the reader's interest because they're like, oh, my God, you know, the body's already been – you're going to have to do a second postmortem because you already had a postmortem. So the question then becomes why. And at that point, I had two reasons why, two avenues I could go down why the body had been autopsy. One would be – it could be that it's a ritualistic killing and you're going to have other bodies found that have been cut up as well. Or the second avenue, and the one that I exploited in the novel, that could be the autopsy was done for a very practical reason because the person who did it needed something and needed to do an autopsy in order to gain that, that thing. And that's the path that I chose to go down. So having that in mind, but the flexibility of, as I'm writing the story, I could have gone either way. And introduced this as a serial killer case as opposed to a more methodical type of killing and, and a more practical reason why the body was autopsy. I chose, you know, the the one that uh, led to the more practical reason. I could have gone the other way. So allowing choices in the flow of the story is important as well. And I know that people will outline the book from A to Z before they write it will be like, no, don't ever do that. You're going to write yourself into a corner. And my response to that is I totally get it. I understand that that's not the way you write it. But sometimes writing yourself into a corner is not such a bad thing. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Um, when I, I've done some writing, I went back to my old high school years ago, and they had a class that were, they wanted to be writers. So I wanted to push them to use their creativity to the highest extent that they possibly could. And here's how I did it. I gave them each a newspaper. And I said, take a newspaper story from the front page, go to the back of the paper, take a separate story uh, from the back of the newspaper, and you write a story about both those stories, combining them together in a plausible way. When you write yourself into a corner, you have to work extra hard to write yourself out of a corner, and sometimes the creative juices flow to such an extent that it's unparalleled if you had outlined everything ahead of time. I get outlines. I use them. Um, I don't outline the whole book. I've never known the ending of the book before I sit down to write it. But what that allows me to do is to have some flexibility, some latitude, and some choices that I can make along the way that don't neatly fit into an outline that was written before I ever sat down to even explore a character. My answer to the outline is going to be, well, if I'm creating a brand new series, like an Am Stacker, who's a very quirky, very original kind of guy, and I've never even met, spent time with him on the page in a story, how can I outline everything this guy's going to do? I don't even know him yet. I don't even know what he was capable of. 
Um, it will take me with a new character 50 to 100 pages to kind of figure that out on the page. I can't outline that. It all depends on the story that I want to put them into and whether that melds with the skills and, and the characters that I built them into. Um, so in Walk the Wire, another series character shows up in the middle of this, and I had to build them. And the reason I did that was twofold. One, I thought that Decker was going to need some help in this one because some of it, some of what he's investigating was sort of out of his bailiwick. It's not things that he really you know, knew a whole lot about. So he was at a disadvantage vis-a-vis the people he was opposing. And two, you know, does it fit the skills and the backgrounds that I've built into these characters? Um, so if it's a heavily investigative detective sort of mystery, that's not going to be something that, you know, Will Roby and Jessica Real are going to excel at. That's not really what they do. Uh, it's going to be somebody who, you know, needs to be able to kill people from a long distance and to travel around the world, setting up targets and then taking them out. Amos Decker can't do that. That's not what he does either. So sometimes it's got to be the story has to fit the personalities and the, and the skill set of the characters that I've created. But a reason to create new characters is one to keep me energized and out of my comfort zone. As a writer, you don't want to get into a comfort zone because once you get into a comfort zone and you say to yourself, I know how to do this, I can, you know, I can just go through the motions and phone it in and I've got this all down pat and I've got my outline and I know what the reader wants and it's going to be great. You know, I'm going to keep cranking these books out and make lots of money. And then you've lost it as a writer. You've lost your edge. You've lost it all. The stories aren't going to be as good. The character's not as crisp. Storytelling not as good. And the reader's going to move on to somebody else because you're in your comfort zone. And that's a terrible place to be as a writer. So for me, I create new characters to scare the crap out of myself and that I can't bring the magic again. So I have to create a whole new world again. But that takes me out of my comfort zone. I can't phone it in. Uh, because I haven't dialed that number before. And uh, the longer you write, the more you have to challenge yourself to keep yourself fresh, energized, actually in the love of writing. Once you fall out of the love of writing and you consider it a process and you consider it a job and an occupation for which you were paid, yes, you'll continue to, to write and people will continue to read you, but the fun will be gone. Let me talk to you about that outline very quickly then, David. Um Quite, you described it earlier as, as the river flowing. Quite often on the show, authors will describe it as a road trip uh, and, and the map that you set out with before you go. So before you turn on your engine, before you start going, David, how much do you know about the journey that you are taking? Uh, when will you figure out where you're finishing up? Uh, at what point do things become clear to you, plot points through the, through the windscreen as you drive? Um, I would say for the first hundred pages, I, it's a total feeling out process and I could go a number of different directions. Once you get to about 150, 200 pages, things solidify. You've made your choices and you're going to go down a certain road or you're going to take a boat down a certain river and there's no way back up the river. There's no way to turn the boat or the car around. You've got to go where you're going to go. With that said, you still have some options. And the options come in the second half of the book where you can have myriad ways for the subplots to burn off and pay off. Um, and I, sometimes I will only think about those when I get to them. Obviously your mind is always, always subconsciously thinking about a lot of these things and epiphanies and revelations, all they are, are, it's not like you weren't thinking about it. And you just, it popped into your head. Your subconscious was completely immersed in it. And the revelation and epiphany hit just because your subconscious finally kicked it to your conscious level. And there it is, uh -huh, your aha moment. So in, at the ending, probably when I'm about three quarters of the way through the book, like the Adley Pine book I'm working on right now, I've got 85,000 words written. I probably have another 30,000 to write, but I'm pretty confident now in the ending how this book is going to end at this point. And I probably arrived at that um, feeling about two weeks ago. Um, and, um, and that's sometimes that's earlier than I usually do. Some, you know, some books it's later uh, than I usually do. Uh, but it's it's all kind of a thing. So the first hundred pages or so, it's kind of freewheeling. You know, I'm I'm going off road. I'm, I'm driving on the shoulder. I'm backed up. You know, and um, put it in reverse and drive down the highway. And the cars are flying all past me, going, "Who the hell is that guy?" Um, so the first hundred pages could be a lot of fun. They can also be very frustrating because writers like to have a direction. You know, they want to feel like they're making progress. And sometimes that first hundred, hundred and fifty pages are kind of chaotic and frenetic. And you're like, oh my God, is this going to, am I going to have to trash all of this? Is this not working? Am I, am I being too freewheeling about this? But 
so long as you're asking good questions along the way, so long as you, you know, you're doing the research you need to do, so you're building a good factual basis. Uh, and so long as you understand that you can be flexible and trust your characters. You know, I trust my characters at this point, particularly like Amos Decker. I've written, this is my sixth book with him. I feel like, you know, he makes good decisions because I built him in a good way. Um, and um, so I, I kind of trust my instincts. And by trusting my instincts, I'm trusting my characters. Mentioned earlier, you used to work as a lawyer. I've had discussions with some authors who were uh, lawyers before, and they always say it was almost the perfect breeding ground for being a writer because it offers you a creative outlet. You might have a lot of creative energy that perhaps isn't being fulfilled in some parts of working in the law, and this gives you the chance to do that. And it also uh, teaches you about working fastidiously. What do you think about this? I think that writing, uh, uh, being a lawyer and being a writer share a number of common attributes. And I talked with some of the writers, my John Grisham, Scott Turo. Um, it's as a writer, the only uh, arrows I had in my quiver were words. That was the only thing I worked with throughout the entire day. And whether I was building a legal case for trial or a deal that I was doing for a business, I was putting a story together. And I was a trial lawyer for most of my career. So I took I took the same set of facts that the other side had. It's called a trial record. So it's not like you can make up your own facts. It's not it's not like American politics, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would um, take the same set of facts the other side had. I would tell a completely different story. And how do I do that? Well, it was about what I chose to focus on and what I chose to deflect. It was what the words that I chose to use as opposed to the other side. It was the foundation of the story that was remarkably different from the other side what they were writing. So my whole life was built upon words. My whole life was built around research because you have to know the facts. You have to go out and interview people. You have to hunt down information. You have to get sources. You have to read a lot and distill a lot into something simple that people can understand. Because when you're talking to a judge or a jury, they're not going to know nearly as much about this subject matter as you just spent the last year of your life on, obviously. So you can't go in and just regurgitate everything you know. They'll be hopelessly lost. So that's what, that's where the distillation comes from, taking a lot of research and information, distilling it down into discrete facts that have a lot of punch and a lot of importance and conveying that to other people. It's exactly what I do as a novelist. It's exactly what I did as a lawyer. And then you have to be in command of the material. Um, I was a lawyer pre-internet, pre-computer day. So we would walk into court with a hand truck full of boxes and you have thousands of documents in there that you're going to use to question witnesses with on the stand and to refer to as you're making your arguments and legal pleadings that you've already drafted. Today, it's all computerized and easier to access. So for me, you know, I never wanted to even look at those boxes, even though they were there just in case we needed them. I wanted to have command of this, all the material in my head. And that, and that takes a lot of work and a lot of discipline and a lot of, and a lot of intensity. But I bring the same set of skills to writing where I, I, I like to have command of the material in my head so I can draw upon it without having to refer to pages here or there all the time, which kind of takes me out of the storytelling element and the focus that I want to have right at that point. So you can find those attributes here really remarkably parallel. Uh, so the transition, I was writing since I was a kid, but I practiced law for 10 years. So the transition was remarkably easy for me because it was like, you know, instead of, um, telling a story to a judge or a jury and writing legal pleadings and briefs. Um, I, I was fictionalizing everything. I was just making stuff up. I didn't have to adhere to a set and set, certain set of facts. But the storytelling, the research, the narration, the command of the material is all the same. And lastly, you say you write many hours a day. You read up to 12 newspapers and magazines a day sometimes. Just how many hours do you actually get to sleep? I don't sleep probably as much as, the, as most people. Um, I, uh, I get by, you know, five, six, maximum kind of seven hours of sleep. I like to wake up early, get up early and get going. That's just always been sort of my nature. But even when I'm sleeping, and I'm sure most writers will tell you this too, they're still thinking about it. The plot just becomes a part of your life. You're never away from it, even when you're doing other things. I've, you know, I've been at parties. My wife always loved to tell the stories of me at parties. Well, people will look over, and I'm sitting in the corner with a blank stare on my face, and they'll go over to Michelle and say, oh, my God, is David okay? He looks like he's had a stroke. 
And she looks over. She says, no, he's just finishing a chapter. Give him 10 minutes. He'll be back. <laughs> and that is it for this week's Writer's Routine. Thank you so much to David for coming on the show. Uh, I'm just in awe of how prolific he is how ubiquitous and universal his stories are as well, written all over the world, translated into so many different languages. Being able to write a good mystery thriller uh, really does set you well, doesn't it? If you can do that, if you can make it accessible to so many people around the around the earth, uh, I, th- I think you're on to a good idea there, and David has absolutely mastered it. So pleased to get some tips and advice from him on the show. Uh, you can find out more about Walk the Wire over on our website. It's writersroutine.com. Obviously, while you're there, Do say hello. Let me know what you think. Let me know if there's any authors that you want on the show over on our contact form. Click on that. Say hello. Uh, If you're listening to us through Apple Podcasts as well, please do leave a review. If you're not, maybe tell someone that you know about the show. Uh, I don't know if you've got a mate that has started writing or you're part of a a virtual book club that's meeting on Zoom or or you're doing a virtual writer's retreat, maybe. I don't want to think about how that would work. Anyway, let them know what we do. Let them know that we can help them out. Uh, Also, give us a follow on Twitter. We are at WritersPod on there, trying to keep that updated fairly regularly. Uh, And we'll see you next week where we are chatting to the Carnegie Medal shortlisted writer, Anthony McGowan. That's next week on Writer's Routine. I will see you then. Bye. (laughs) 